and just for people who might be listening in from this point because we've already done the introductions a big warm welcome to the global wisdom support call it's april and because we came on with a topic planned this time that came out of the last session we thought that other people might be interested in hearing it and so we're recording this session for the wider community so the session for those of you that weren't here last time we went right back to basics we talked about the roadmap we looked quite a lot at what that preparation phase was and we got up to communication level within which we had lots of time to talk at heart level what happens when the heart doesn't talk easily or is a bit guarded um, and we just begun the conversation on gut at that same level and we kind of ran out of time so the focus today is on having conversations with the gut when they don't just go smoothly when for whatever reason somebody might block or nick a uh, communication and in particular whether or not we start there or we weave to that point the whole concept of sometimes it's us stopping ourselves and that it's a, a younger version of us or another version of our identity that is almost in conflict with the version of us that is wanting whatever we're there for coaching on does that make sense so i'm really happy to open it up for yeah your input conversation thoughts um have you had clients that have done that how have you got past it how do you gently encourage them to access that deeper part of themselves that they might be a bit fearful of showing now i've shopped you all into silence maybe we should do some breathing first okay let's just spend a minute or so bringing ourselves into beautiful coherence so that we can deeply access our own guts um, and actually you know have a deeper conversation with each other at that gut and heart level so any of the trainers on board fancy doing a bit of a leaded leading leading us into balanced breathing doesn't have to be a trainer of course don't know why i said that anyone fancy leading us into balanced breathing Okay, I'm back to you. Any trainers like to practice? I could give it a go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Clive. I love Clive's voice. I was hoping yep. he'd say yes. <laughs> okay, so everybody get themselves comfortable. So just relax yourself, but not totally relaxed, obviously, because you want to be in that sort of calm, alert state, but just relax the body. So just check in with the body to see if there's anywhere there's some tension, perhaps around the neck or the head or the face particularly the jaw. So just bring yourself in and centre yourself. You start to release any tension and just get your head so it's nicely positioned on top of your shoulders. And just zoom around the body and see if there's anywhere that needs relaxing as you start to concentrate on your breathing. And just become aware of your breath. Become aware of the length of the breathing. Make sure that it's equal in breath and ex out breath. And just bring yourself into a nice, easy rhythm. One that's easy and flowing, gentle and soft. And breathe deeply into your abdomen. Perhaps imagining there's a balloon that inflates on the in-breath and deflates on the out-breath. That's right. Just continue to breathe. Now you want to perhaps bring some, some sort of feeling, perhaps gratitude or love, compassion, or just even a nice thought or picture and bring it into your heart bring it into that heart area as you continue to breathe deeply bringing yourself to your center letting go of anything that might be sticking you and calming the mind
And then in your own time, just gently start to become aware of your body. And slowly bring yourself back to the here and now. I don't know about everyone else, but I don't want to come back to here and now. <laughs> I quite like being there. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Thanks, Clive. All righty. So now that we're in that beautiful, calm, coherent place, and coherence is so much more than just a heart level. It's all of the brains coming into coherence. Anyone got a client that they, you know, struggle to get gut communication with or... Um, you know, something was just a little bit harder work at that gut level. I actually had a, a client, I think, um, 10 days ago. Um, she was basically struggling with letting go of uh, a relationship with a man that she knows is not going anywhere. Okay, fine. So we start talking about it. What's important to you? What's in your heart, etc. But then she was. It was like she was. Uh, there was too much emotion in the heart. The love, the longing, the missing, the wanting. Uh, but then, whenever it was a time to communicate with the gut, she couldn't. And and, um, and as much as we tried uh, to communicate, uh, it she it kept talking about emotions and feelings, which is mm. sort of a heart function. Mm. So I was wondering if she actually blocked the gut and continued to communicate with the heart only. Uh, what I noticed is when we were talking to the heart or to the head, she had her eyes closed and uh, she was in it. The moment we wanted to go to the gut, she opened her eyes and she refused to close them. And I, and I had to say, I felt that, okay, it looks like she's not feeling safe. Um, so I had to say things like, okay, remember you're safe. And it's obviously a virtual session. And I know this person really well. So I've known her for over a decade. So, and we're, we know each other well. So um, it just, she couldn't go to the gut in any way. So I, eventually she refused to continue and she became sort of aggressive uh, and uh, she said, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. So I was, we ended up just calming her down and uh, just realizing that she's a yoga practitioner. So uh, to her, she's like, okay, now I do have the understanding that I need to access my uh, base chakras or like my solar plexus. I maybe I need to do something about that. So she felt that this was the realization for her, but she refused to continue with uh, like completely. I felt like, oh, I failed. <laughs> but uh, I realized that there is a big block there. And I, at the moment, at that, when I was there, I really didn't know what to do with it. Mm, interesting that as the coach we always blame ourselves right i failed <laughs> yes. actually it sounds to me like you gave her the biggest gift because you have given her that awareness that she's not connected at that level and you know sometimes that's all that they can handle in that one session and that it, it is too big a leap to go further beautiful so i always find it easier when there's a client to discuss rather than a generic so you've just heard this beautiful client story what did you hear? What did you notice? What would you be curious about as an MBIT coach if that had been your client? I would have been curious. Clive, Clive, Clive you go first. Um, I'd be curious what the gut needed in order to feel safe to communicate. Mm. I, mean, I find that a big question. I mean, that's it took me a while to actually get that question in my head. But if you use that, what does the gut need? It's amazing how that is an opener. Yeah. Yeah, yeah beautiful. That, um, I don't know if you remember, um, in your coach set, there was a flip chart on the wall that was kind of the basic language for each of the brains. And so there was, yeah. you know, head, heart, gut down the left-hand side, the really, truly, deeply down the middle, and then a frame into each prime function on the right-hand side of that chart. And... 
you know, especially for new coaches, it's so good to have that in front of you. And we can do it so easily now we're on Zoom because no one can see it's in front of us. Um, because if you ever get stuck, there are your questions. So what does the gut deeply need? And then you can say to feel safe if that's what you feel the, the block is about is a beautiful um, kind of entry point in. And uh, I think sometimes we try and be a little bit too clever and we forget those basic questions. Even if we just ask those nine questions off of that sheet, we'd get amazing results. So beautiful. Yeah. What does the gut deeply need? Do you want to come back on that one? Deeper? Yeah, I actually just looked at some notes that I took and I kept them because I'm keeping notes of things as I learn how to, you know, go back and think of what I could have done better. Beautiful. And I remember looking at it, the first thing that she said going down to the gut is what does the gut want to uh, communicate to your needs? Um, she said, she immediately said, it's very safe. There's nothing threatening this. She just said it to start with. I'm like, okay, it's weird that that was the first that came out of it. So it's obviously maybe not the gut. She's trying to tell herself, I'm safe, um, it's okay. Uh, and maybe it's something that just came intuitively to her that now that she's going there, uh, she's looking at her safety. Uh, but then afterwards, nothing came out. Uh, and this is when, like, she started by stating that she was safe, but then nothing came out. So it, it could be that she might have felt safe, but there is no communication other than that. Um, nothing came out there. I would trust your instincts on that. I would almost, almost go, there's a safety issue. Um, and that mm -hmm. your instinct that it was safety was probably right. The fact that she said that, yeah, it could be a head dominant story. She's trying to tell herself to reassure herself. So question to the master coaches, what else did you hear that would make you go with that intuition that it's about safety? What, what, within the story, what did you hear, even if it wasn't something the client said? I could say, where could I start? <laughs> <laughs> but that would be a bit too playful, wouldn't it? It would have um, been. Just give us one. It, just a little bit. It's all about safety, isn't it? Yeah. for me and as um anyone that's on you that is a master coach will know how closely related and connected the ans and the gut are um and especially because it's a relationship issue um and there's a lot going on at a heart level there could be a lot of safety issues going on alongside that and connected with that and interwoven with that especially with previous relationships as well and that could be that could be blocked at a get level it could be an a and s level so for me this is just a beautiful advertisement for why it's an incredibly beautiful idea to do master coach <laughs> that's a cheeky ad and it wasn't what i what it wasn't what i was driving at okay beautiful what behavior did you see that makes you think that there's a major ans response in this and this is for anyone because you would have spotted it whether or not your master coach you may not have known the full link to gut brain but you would have spotted it um i'd say the fact that she got quite aggressive towards the end yeah so what are the two well you know we actually know there's more than two now but what are the two main kind of responses at sympathetic level you mean fight or flight fight or flight yeah, yeah. so she did both right mm -hmm. she did a bit and of she was defending bit of aggressive fighting and then I'm out of here I'm not doing this anymore flighting Suzanne was there evidence sorry to interrupt was there evident because I from the story the thing that's going around my head is every time we went to the gut she opened her eyes to me that is resistance anyway and that's almost a fight and flight in a uh, physical way rather than a verbal yes. uh, picking up? you're you're picking up a beautiful piece that unless you're a master coach you wouldn't know the full link to the eyes open and why yeah. that is another way of trying to self-soothe yeah but for me it's just like that's that's body language and it's yeah. just like yeah, that's where I would start what is it that means that you open your eyes every time we go here yeah um, and that's how I would have started the conversation but thank you for clarifying that and I'm going to mute myself now <laughs> <laughs> no not at all juicy 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 okay so lots of ANS going on so even at coach level you pick up there's lots of ANS going on but the indications are it's sympathetic 
what are you going to do? Ask them to breathe. And breathe how? Into Very that level. Deep into the gut. Yep, so deeply will stimulate parasympathetic. How else can you kind of direct them to breathe? Because they're way off balance, right? They're nowhere near this middle bit. They're way off to sympathetic. Longer exhales. Beautiful. Beautiful. So some really lovely out breaths or sighing or... Oh, let's just take a moment. Let's just remind ourselves that right here, right now, we're completely safe. Put your hand on your gut. Give it some comfort, some nurture, some safety. Let it know it's okay. What does it need in order that we'll even come into the conversation? And remember, you can't not communicate. So it is communicating. It's letting you know without any uncertain terms, it's unhappy. <laughs> does that make sense? Anyone else pick up anything else? Because that was a juicy client case. Okay, so let's go down the topic that we were kind of framing all of today around. The sorts of things going through my head in relation to there being different versions of you in this case would be who is the you that wants to fight or flight? Because you're sat in front of me. There's a part of you that wanted to come and sort this out. But who is the you that is now so scared they want to get the heck out of here? Would be one way of beginning to access into that deeper level of identity. Um, all sorts of ways that can be answered. So this is where we're going into complete speculation mode because we didn't ask the question, therefore we don't know how she'd answer. Mm -hmm. um, anyone ever, because I've taught this to a few people across the way, anyone ever done this? What sort of responses do you get? When you say, who's the you that's really frightened? What sort of responses do you get? I don't know as a frequent response. <laughs> Sorry, you don't know as a... Yeah, they, they oh, often, I, don't I, know. I don't know, but that's almost like that. That's just at least they're starting to respond. Yeah, so, yeah beautiful. Yeah. So, mm. yeah, and and so, okay, so if I was playing your client and I went, mm, I don't know, hmm. how would you follow that up? No, it, well, I would start with, that's absolutely okay. Yeah, it's okay that you don't know right now. So let's start to explore. Are you prepared to do that? So get that agreement first that they're prepared to safely, reassuringly. And then I would almost dissociate mm. and just do a come up and look above yourself and go, who is the you that you're looking at in this situation? Beautiful. And a reminder, what? because I don't know if you're all NLP trained, what does dissociation do? We cover it briefly in Coach Sir. What does dissociation do? Why is that a good, whenever there's a safety issue, if you can dissociate temporarily, what does it do within the whole context? I know the answer, like but I'm just waiting. <laughs> do you want to say again? I guess it's like from a space point of view, you're kind of um, having your other self as a different part. So you're completely not that part so you're away and just looking from a distance which means this is the safety distance it's beautiful really so it is safer it's reducing the emotional connection to it you're standing outside of the emotion looking at the emotion or outside of the fear looking at the fear it gives the client a different perception of the situation beautiful. so i quite often do is take the person out of their seat throwing in some of the other toolbox of tools that we all have as coaches, take them out of their seat and look back at themselves sitting in the place where they were um, lovely. and just throw in a few more of my coaching tools there. Yeah, lovely. Because what you're doing then is like an embodied dissociation. 
So sometimes if you ask someone to step outside only in their head, they might struggle to do that if they're so attached to this being, but I'm frightened, I'm frightened. But if you physically move them, you're ramping up the chances that they'll be able to do that and then look back at themselves. Beautiful. Anything else? I don't know. I still don't know. I'm, I'm the absolute client you wouldn't want. No, I don't know. It's still not talking to me. I can't see. It just looks like me. In, then get them back into their head, which they're very confident in, and get them to imagine the situation with visualization. Beautiful. And that, that kind of brings up um, that beautiful metaphor that I stole from you in the last one where, you know, let's just change the channel. Remote control. <laughs> let's oh, just yeah. tune into what your head's watching right now. <laughs> Nice. So try to weave around. Remember the whole calibration going into communication is to get easiest access point and then easiest leverage point. So if when you go into one of the brains, it's hard work and there's some resistance, you may well be able to get into that through one of the other brains where it is easier. You don't have to, at communication level, you do not have to be in the foundational sequence. You go wherever it's easiest communication. This is a gentle, respectful process. You're not trying to grab someone by the scruff of the neck and force them. You're holding them by the hand and walking with them. Beautiful. So let's say I am sat in the other chair and I'm looking back at myself and I go, Oh, that's the young teenage me. That's who's frightened. And that's just me making something up, right? Because sometimes it's a very young child. Sometimes it's not that yet much younger than you. Sometimes there might be multiple yous that are involved. But let's say I come up with, oh, yeah, that's that young teenage me. How are you going to work with that? And remember, I put a caveat on this for anyone that's listening here and on board. We are not trying to make ourselves therapists, right? This is just a, a level of communication with the gut. If you start to move into pure therapy, you need to refer them on to a registered therapist. But at this level, I don't believe we're moving into therapy, although we are moving outside of traditional ICF style coaching. We are definitely moving into that gray area between therapy and coaching. So you do need to hold the space and keep yourself safe and your client safe and be aware of where your boundaries are of how far you'll go on this. But in my mind as an MBIT coach, all I'm thinking about is if I can get that gut to communicate with me and release a nick or a nib, I've got a chance of getting them back into alignment. I'm not trying to sort out some big abuse history or trauma or any of that i am merely trying to get the gut to communicate okay so that having said and ebony's put a nice one up so on the chat line ebony said what does the teenage girl need to feel safe beautiful so you're straight into communicating and effectively what we're communicating with is the teenage girl's gut what does her gut need to feel safe so that she can communicate with the adult you See where we're going? How far you take that depends what comes up. And sometimes that's enough to get that younger you back into the conversation. And you can go back into your communication or foundational sequence. Sometimes, occasionally, I've ended up with a foundational sequence going on the younger one and the foundational sequence going of the older one. And then ultimately getting them to negotiate. So it's almost like I come out of the MBIT process, do a mini MBIT negotiation of the two, not a part. So this is not about me trying to get rid of the younger them. That younger them still stays for as long as they want to stay. They may become less vocal. They may go into the background. They may, you know, I'll often, when, when I'm over the whole process, um, I'll make sure that that younger them has got the right place to be in the gut. 
that you can always go back to them and get more learning or communication later and you might find that actually now that learning's been had they go into the background and they're happy living wherever you leave them living in the gut and you don't hear from them again but i never use it as a part to collapse or integrate those two completely if that's going to happen it's going to happen naturally once the communications happen and i've done something very similar as well suzanne beautiful and talk, talk about yours sean what's what's really beautiful I'll, I'll, I'll just use one person that springs to mind that i think about what's beautiful about it is that especially if it's a younger version as in child or teenager nine times out of ten and not obviously not all the time but nine times out of ten what that younger version needs is love and compassion and soothing and nourishing and nurturing and by having by working with the two foundational sequences then the older version the now version can be willing and open to offering that nurture and that soothing and that love and care and compassion and kindness to that younger version and then that lifts that sense of safety in the younger version because that's what they deeply need the most in that moment so that's just one example which does tend to come up quite a lot yeah. but it is just one example and it's a beautiful way that's why it made me smile when you were talking about it because it's a beautiful way isn't it of the two parts if you'd like communicating between each other and like you said integration naturally happens then yeah i would wholly agree i think the vast majority of times i've done it it's that need for love recognition being seen being heard whatever um, so I don't know how you play with it, Sean. When I am in that situation and a younger version of them comes out, I will actually ask the question, where is that younger you right now in relation to you physically? And they'll place them in the room somewhere. Mm -hmm. They're either the other side of the room with their back to you at that point or they're right next to me, but they're looking at the floor or whatever. And I get them to physically work with where they're perceiving that other them to be and yeah what would what would the younger one like to say what needs to be heard what would the older one like to say has the older one heard that now what does she want to do in response to that and i say she but i've done this with blokes as well it's not just with women um, i have the most gorgeous guy he's a cfo and um he's actually an mbit coach so if he's listening to this i'll make sure that i just make him completely and utterly unrecognizable but this most gorgeous guy who came up with a little version of himself who he called little same name so let's say it was you know harry oh yeah it's little harry and he's got two little harrys and he's got a very little harry and he's got a teenage harry and we quite regularly go back and have conversations with these other two versions of him and they're both gorgeous and they've both got huge things to bring to the table like one of them's really cheeky little 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 harry is so cheeky and mischievous and playful and teenage harry he's got balls right he's he's not gonna let anyone mess him around and it's like how can we bring all of those gifts and knowings of those to be available to the adult harry and it's just such a beautiful process and it's genuine beautiful gift. beautiful gift and it doesn't necessarily happen in one session so you know i think it in, from memory it was the little little harry that showed first and the next time in the next session he came along with a picture of little little harry like physically a picture a photograph mm -hmm. I've, I've been going through this i found this this is this is who i'm talking to great do you know what i think that's a be i think that's a beautiful reminder as well suzanne that for, for anybody for anybody but especially for anybody listening to the recording that you don't need to resolve or sort this out or get from a to b in one session um and to, to lower expectations on that and also for it to be okay not to go up the road map in one session Absolutely. if you have to stay in communication or calibration 
then that's absolutely okay. It's like, let the client lead you and go at their pace. And there's no, there's no shoulds. The only nah. shoulds are potentially in your head brain or, or another part of you, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, totally and utterly agree. Totally and utterly agree. So back to Dima, your beautiful client, you did them such a favor giving them that insight. And actually I would say, you also did them a favor not pushing through in one session to try to force that out that the very fact that you've done that you've given them respect and safety and given them the control as to when they would like to begin the communication at that level and it may be i'm completely hypothesizing here but if part of that safety issue is i don't have a voice i've never been heard what you've done is given them that for the first time possibly in their life and said, when you're ready. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> so, well, you know, not hopefully, I think everything you've said indicates that that's the case. And so our job then as an MBIT coach is what? So let's say somebody does, you know, there is a, a fear issue going on or a safety issue, or sometimes it's an identity issue as well. That, like there's a perception of who you could be, should be, you know, were before something happened, whatever. What's your job? for them when you're not going to get up the roadmap you're not gonna you know get the full interventional resolution in that session what what's your prime job yeah carrie leave them in a safe space and i was just yeah. going to say something similar i was just going to say leaving them in a safer space than when they came in yeah 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 i was thinking just keep make sure at least it ends with them being relaxed not tensed uh, not leaving the session or leaving you while they're agitated in any way just maybe change the topic or joke just make them relax so that they leave with a, with a good feeling towards the end of it yeah beautiful which brings us back to breathing and all that that you can task with christelle um, I had a client last week that um, the, had the same experience, like um, being able to go to the gut. And in the end, she also got anxious and um, she wanted to start crying. So I took her back to the heart after we did a whole session and then we came to the gut where we could, couldn't go through. And then I took her back into her heart and we, go in, we went into gratitude and just loving and compassion and really just going back into really appreciating herself and her compassionate heart and everything and then feeling it flowing through her whole body and getting it just into a safe space again and then um, we, we, we ended the session and I spoke to her today and we we're going to have a session tomorrow again and then she said to me you know what, um, because I wanted to do a timeline with her, and she said, no, you know what, I don't think I need a timeline anymore. I, I feel so much better after this whole week. So I'm, we know that there's so many things happening for a person after they leave. Mm. It's not your responsibility to bring that, that change. It will happen in them just by the way that, and but just leave them at that safe space. Beautiful. And what do we know about the gut, brain, and timing? dwell time yeah longer dwell time right so yeah. we don't even expect the gut to respond for 24 36 hours so you're mm -hmm. never going to know the full impact or the integration of the change for that time with anybody even if you get a really great response in the room you know it's going to shift over the next 24 36 hours so oh, yeah, absolutely i was just going to say if i had a pound or a dollar for you for every time I've worked That'd with someone. That'd be two dollars for equivalent, but. <laughs> or there and thereabouts. <laughs> but if I'd had a pound or a dollar or two dollars for every time somebody come back to a next session and gone, do you know, a couple of days, a day or a couple of days after, something just shifted. Yeah. It's like, really? Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> and it does raise the question about follow ups and how you you know, check in on people, especially if you have touched on something that's really deep and brought up a fear issue or a safety issue. 
um, checking in on them or asking them to check in with you in a couple of days, just making sure they're okay. Um, you know, it's good practice. It's good, safe practice. As well as future I've, pacing, isn't it? Uh, and doing the, and installing, obviously we need to be careful of what we install. Was, but we don't install anything as MBIT coaches. John. <laughs> what are you suggesting? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but future, I'll rephrase that and reframe it. Future pacing into the, like, if anything does, then so that when it does come up, they know that that's okay. Yeah. It's not this, oh, I feel something. Does that mean if we go back to the conversation we we're having earlier, what does that mean about me? Does that mean there's something wrong with me? It's that if you've already had that communication, then if they feel something, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's uncomfortable or not, then it does, it's not as scary. Mm. Because sometimes, as we know, nice feelings can feel scary if they come up unannounced and if we know that look stuff might come up and that's okay and it's you can check in with me or which obviously depends on what your boundaries are with with yeah. clients in between sessions um then that that helps with that as well and it it's, yeah. it prolongs that safety issue when the client's not with you obviously not with you personally at the moment because we're all on zoom aren't we um because of the, the situation but it, it it helps prolong that safety and then for them to have that safety mm. remain for longer if things come up in between sessions yeah and that normalizing of it and especially if you're yeah. not going to get through the whole roadmap in one session so you don't have the chance to do that beautiful highest expression gifted icing on the top of the cake meditation at the end because you haven't got that far it is about leaving them with um, some invited positive reframes. Does that sound better than install? An invited positive reframe. <laughs> I like that. You like that? Invited, invited positive reframe. I'm going to use that and steal it. I was just going to mention, I, I was reminded actually with a client the other day, um, and I probably didn't didn't quite grasp how deeply, deeply she was working. Um, but for any but new people that might listen to this recording, a reminder that um, when we work with the gut, it can often shift the gut as well. And I got an email from her a day or two later that said, thanks for our session. I went, I went away and I had a real cry. She said, I started to get thoughts and I just cried my eyes out. She said, and then about three hours later, my bells shifted as well. And so I, I went back and reassured her that was absolutely fine. Normal. I normally mm. warn my clients about that, but so I've, I've been reflecting and I'm going, what did I miss that meant that I didn't see that coming and therefore didn't warn her? So I went back and reassured her, but just a reminder for everybody else, when we work with the gut, it moves it. <laughs> And it is a balancing act because you don't want to install that that's going to happen. You don't want to imply that it's absolutely normal. Therefore, if it doesn't, there's something wrong. Yeah, that's it's it. about the kind of range of options and possibilities and, you know, smorgasbord of possible yeah. reactions, all of which are, are fine and normal. Mm. And just, I'm just being aware. I missed something not to, to say that that might occur. But, you know, it, it is what it is and she's fine. But it's just, it's got me rethinking again. What did I miss? Working on Zoom and I like working one on one in the room because the energy is quite yeah. different. So, yeah, yeah, so it was quite interesting. You know, and again, maybe there was nothing you missed. Maybe it did come up maybe. after the session. Yeah. Good maybe point. it Thank sparked you. something you. in us. You know, we're so quick to beat ourselves up and blame ourselves, aren't we? So quick. That's because we want to be it. the best we can be. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> okay, so um, aware and conscious of time, and that for some people it's, it's incredibly late now. You're going to end them in a safe place. You're going to leave them with some nice breathing and bring them back to as much of an autonomic balance as you can, preferably with some teaching and instruction about how they do that for themselves in the gap before you meet them next time. What sort of tasking might be appropriate to leave them with for someone who has struggled to get gut communication and we think there's a safety issue going on? What would be some good tasks you could leave them with? I smiled then because I was like, 
my I immediately went to master coach and I was like no you have to take a step back you have to think coach no, that's okay say it and we'll just reframe it in a way that makes sense without the underpinning knowledge say what you're thinking all right well my my gut immediately my instincts immediately were to task with some um simple exercises that would help with vagal toning oh beautiful to help okay. to help build safety and yep. that's obviously we're master coach territory it is and you know we already talk about the autonomic nervous system at coach set level um, yeah. so there's, there's all sorts of things you can you can go and read about how you stimulate the vagus nerve i'll do a bit of a plug for the new website embrainingtheworld.com has got vagus hacks on there as one of the topics and on there is a sheet of options of how you can stimulate the vagus nerve um, which will bring in deep parasympathetic you know movement um so yeah have a look on that it was something that i created um i created for my clients and then i gifted it to the embraining.com now sarah who's um much more artistic and and graphic than me changed the look of it because she said it needed greater street appeal but this was my original version so that's what it is today for sheet basically and if i just come in on one line so you can see so there's a rocking chair um rocking is really good for us parasympathetic smiling really good we've mentioned that where else have i go the other side um there's a laughter one uh praying so it's basically it is how many one two three four five roughly 25 ways of stimulating the parasympathetic nervous system and I just give them a copy of this and say, pick one or two and play with them, different ones, different day, and find out which ones get a better response for you. After which one do you really feel? And cold showers in there, Clive, you'll be glad to know. Um, gratitude, massage, sleep, oxytocin, nature. It, they're really low level, ASIC tasks that anyone could do. And then sometimes if I'm, if I'm thinking people might not be totally committed, I'll get them to say which three they're going to try and then we'll kind of create a little timetable of them. So obviously if they pick shower, that's going to be at a normal shower time, right? But you just turn it to cold. Um, if it's gratitude, okay, so when are you going to do your gratitude? You're going to do it morning or evening? Offer them some options. So that's, yeah, that is available. It looks quite different. It's all kind of pale blues and pale greens on the embraining the world but that's it's the same content feel free take that they're free resources um and if you've got clients who want a little bit more input send them over there it's a completely and utterly free resource site that is not advertising anything other than mbit you'll find no company logos you'll find no names on an awful lot of the stuff the only way we put name is on some of the audios where you've then got that relationship rapport and it's only a name it's not a company link so it's a really safe place to send your clients to because they'll still come back to you for the embraining does that make sense can i ask a question of course you can yeah um and this is just this is a curiosity question so um i like i've actually just made a note of what you've said to go and have a and have an explore um i i often tell a story about uh our, our, our comfort zone and i get people to close their eyes and stand on the edge of their comfort zone don't i never ask anybody to go outside it i ask them to dangle their toes off it and stand there for as long as they feel like that circle comes back and puts them in the middle so my question to you is using that sort of uh, metaphor as, as a basis would it be appropriate or would it be a step too far in your opinion if I got them said well some of your home play how about just sitting on the edge of your gut how much communication can you have that's comfortable and allow yourself to extend that comfort and so just simply by sitting and getting yourself in a nice place knowing you're safe doing that um, and just gradually trying to talk to your gut even, you know, more, would that be a step too far, are you thinking, or would that be perfectly appropriate too? I think it would be perfectly appropriate. And can I be controversial? Please. I don't believe we have comfort zones. All right, cool. I think talk we to have, me about that. I think we have familial zones. All right. 
and that often we will stay in something that's familial but not comfortable Mm. but we'll still stay there because at least we know what it is Mm. and I find that sometimes helps people step outside of it when they realize that actually it's not even comfortable Mm. and I'm happy to accept Mm. that because I often say we're so often comfort comfortable in our discomfort yeah if it's uncomfortable it's because it's we know it so yeah but I think sometimes you know for some clients they'll go oh but it's my comfort zone as if it's an excuse to stay there Mm. Yeah. And I'll go, you know, if it was that, if it was that good a comfort zone, would you be here with me now? Yeah. Cool. I shall ponder. I completely that. agree as well, Suzanne. I, I use the familial thing. I also use the safer zone as well. Because it's yeah, sorry, I'm familiar. just waving goodbye to Kerry. Kerry's going to bed because it's the middle of night for her. <coughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Kerry. Have a good sleep. Yeah, sorry, the John, familial, I interrupted. That's, oh, do I? Sorry. Because um, the familial zone is where we feel safer. Yeah. And that's got nothing to do with comfort. It's just about where we feel safer. Yeah. We can feel incredibly safe in something incredibly uncomfortable. We, yeah. can, feel, we can feel safe in something incredibly toxic, but that's a whole different conversation, isn't it? Yeah. And it goes back to what you said earlier, is if, you know, sometimes you do take people out into that beautiful parasympathetic place and they suddenly feel calm for the first time ever, that can feel scary because they don't know what the heck it is. And this comes back again, doesn't it, to where we started at the beginning with, um, I think it was you, Suzanne, saying about like that, that trust in relationship. We're building that relationship with them. And especially if we're potentially talking to a younger version, it, we, it, could, we come, it could come into our awareness, and the younger it is, the more likely it is to come into our awareness, that we could be the first safe relationship that they've had. And if that is the case, then that could make them feel unsafe because that's a scary possibility. And if they feel Um, unsafe, they'll repeat all their old patterns and that will test you. So if you're that first ever safe, comfort, trusting place, they may test that to see if you're serious. So you, you you know, you being in coherence, you making sure you're absolutely providing that sacred space. I love the term sacred space is the best gift you can give them. Do you know, I always like to think of this as, and obviously, you know, you know, I work with parents, but I like to use the analogy of little children, and which is quite fitting because quite often it is a little child that's, um, doesn't it? But it's like, if you set, if you set a boundary with a little one, especially a boundary they really don't want you to set, what are they going to do? They're going to push against that. Um, even if it's something as simple as like say it's a two-year-old who doesn't want to hold your hand and you're about to walk next to a really busy road and you know that they need to hold your hand because it's not safe and at two they haven't got the cognitive ability to understand why it wouldn't really be a very good idea to go running across a road where there's lots of cars coming down at 50 mile an hour um and does that mean that we don't hold that boundary no does that mean that just because they don't like it and they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe in that moment that we don't know because their safety is more important? Mm. And it's like, it's a similar type of thing, isn't it? And sometimes just reframing it in that way, sometimes can, it can help you digest it mm. and you can go, oh yeah. That and ideally sense. if they can create their own boundaries, even better. Mm. Mm. But then you're right, having created that self-boundary, you need to stick to it. And if you've got and this, this internal comes... conflict between two identities, one of them might be trying to stick to it and the other one might be trying to break it. And this comes back to what you were saying about tasking people in between sessions. So it's, um, I use the word promises. What promises are you going to make and keep with yourself? Beautiful. Every day rather than a task. And it's the, um, and, and start small. So it's like quite often I'll say, what one are you going to do? And if, they, if maybe they, they feel more able to add to do two, then brilliant. We'll add that in. 
But as we know, the smaller you start something, the smaller you start a new habit, because that's what it is. We're in st- we're starting to build a new habit, build a new muscle. Um, and the slower we start with that, then or anybody, then the more likely we are to maintain that and keep that promise to ourselves. And then obviously we get that beautiful heart um, sense of joy and appreciation thing because we've achieved that because we've kept that promise to ourselves um so yes that's why i use promises because it tends to bring a little bit more heart into it yeah nice because ultimately that's where we're going once you've got the gut back online you're Mm. then gonna get the communication up to heart and up to head and get them all in agreement um but yeah i would absolutely echo be okay that you may not may not get that in one session and certainly when you're working at that deeper deeper level um you know it could take several sessions before you get to the point where you can move beyond communication level awesome okay well i've had fun i've learned lots um any questions that it kind of raises that you want to bring up before we go um yes suzanne sorry i just want to ask um Around uh, the previous time we spoke, um, I said I, do, I, I, pre- I preferred at this stage to do the timeline coaching session as a separate session. Um, so do you find that the integration of that small, smaller versions of that person in the, when you do it just in the embraining is complete? And do you do a specific mentioning of the integration and where that person go and picks that that piece of himself and integrate it again with himself or just it does it just naturally happen it depends so i'll always make sure they're aware of what's happened to the little them so sometimes they'll say oh she's gone she's gone off playing yeah. and i'll leave it at that um sometimes it's a sense that you know they're left holding and hugging And I say, great, so where can you keep her safe? Where can you put her inside of you so that you can come back and and know where she is and that she's got everything she needs? Create her a little imaginary room, the perfect room where she can be and stay. Um, So, yeah, it's very variable. Ultimately, what tends to happen is when the time's right, the sense of the presence of that littler one just kind of disappears. Okay. Can I just say, I mean, a couple of clients I've had, they've ended up actually bringing that smaller them into their hearts with them. Beautiful. And, um, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And it's gently, gently, right? You're really working at a deep level here and you're on that kind of cusp between coaching and therapy. And if you're not therapists, then you've got to know at what point you go, this is more than just a lack of communication. And I need to have some somebody I can refer on to. Um, but yeah, I've I've worked very successfully with lots of people at that level and kept it within what I believe to be a coaching framework where I'm just communicating, not doing therapy. I think the key thing is about is about trusting ourselves, isn't it? It's about trusting ourselves, trusting our instincts, trusting our intuition. And being creative (laughs) it's like that i i've had it i i just thinking then as you were saying that of a client i had a few months ago who was sat down imagining she was painting with that younger version of her and she could describe what the younger version was painting what colors and everything and it was it was a really beautiful experience and it was like is is that something that i had in my toolkit before and it was like no she she led it and then it's like just trust yourself to to go with it and sometimes that does mean thinking and and approaching things quite creatively based on what your client is bringing and it's like just trust yourself in that moment to go with the flow of that because you've got all these beautiful wonderful skills and tools and we can adapt them and model them in any which way we what especially when it comes to visualization and imagery and colors which as we know the the gut loves and the heart and just trust the process right remember where you are in the process you're just at communication that's all you're doing 
you're doing it creatively you might do it with picture or color or metaphor or story or all you're doing is communicating whatever it takes to get that gut safe enough to communicate so that you can then move on up to congruence either in the next session or down the line beautiful lovely well i can't remember who um suggested that topic but it was a good one to suggest so thank you whoever that was last time um has that led on to anywhere else is there anything obvious that comes out of that you go oh it'd be really lovely to carry this conversation on oh so dima it's under in the website embrainingtheworld.com i'll put it in the chat but um yeah it's a new website that's just gone up in the last week or so do you know it's under which, uh, because I'm on it and I was trying to find... Um, ah, the, uh, hacking, no, Vegas Hacks. Vegas Hacks. Yeah, in Thank the Vegas you. Hacks section. Yeah, so it's a, it's a wisdom project that a group of us are collaboratively putting together. Um, several of whom are on this call. Thank you very much, people. <laughs> Susan, Susan, can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm, 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 I've just recently become an MBIT coach mm -hmm. um, I have, don't have much experience. Um, but what I'm fascinated with and what I'm very interested in is, is where, where you would say there's this gray area between coaching and, and, and therapy. Um, and um, well, we're at the end of the call. I, I don't know how for the, because I know uh, some of you are obviously on uh, coaches for a much, much longer time with a lot of experience. I don't know uh, how many uh, less experienced coaches there are uh, in these sessions. Uh, I wonder if that could be something to go into and, and check and, and maybe share examples from each other, from people who are more experienced to say as well, this is what I would consider therapy. This is where I would draw the line and say, okay, this is out of my uh, territory or, 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 you know. Yeah. I mean, I think it would be a beautiful discussion. I think we just have to frame that discussion of, you can almost guarantee there will be as many pin opinions as there are people on the call and that no one person is right. <laughs> um, there was a, I write regularly for Worldwide Coaching Magazine and there was a whole issue on it recently. Oh, that yeah. kind of, where does that sit? And if, you, if I'd written it 10 years ago, or certainly 20 years ago, it would have read completely differently to now. Um, if we go back to the early days of MBIT, so MBIT was launched in 2012. And in early 2013, Grant applied for ICF credits for it. And he didn't get them. And we applied again, and he didn't get them. We applied again, and he didn't get them. And eventually, he got a letter from ICF saying, you will never get them because it's an ontological based coaching and that's not coaching. Now already that's changed and they are now awarding credits. And I think there's three people who have managed to get ICF accreditation for, um, and I say managed, it's only be, it's not that the rest of us haven't managed, it's we've chosen not to pay the money to ICF. All right. It's a financial thing, right? Um, yeah. But they are now awarding credits for that. So even their, and they've got, because they're a bigger organization, they've got a clearer framework, if you like, of what coaching is and what it isn't. Even theirs has changed enormously in that last how many years? Eight years. So I think it's something that is evolving and changing. Um, I think there will be lots of different opinions about where that boundary sits, whether there is a clear boundary or whether, as I believe, there's a gray area in the middle. And depending where you then sit, what you can call yourself. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, I think that would make a great wisdom call conversation. As long as I we can agree to be nice to each other and agree that we might not agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. in the spirit of embracing, Suzanne, the spirit the, of let's, leave, let's leave with compassion. Yeah. Yeah. And I might, um, if I can work out how, I'll see if I can share that issue of Worldwide Coaching Magazine. Thing is, it's a paid resource so i don't have the rights to share it per se hmm. think about that hmm. if you're interested in reading my contribution to that issue maybe email me direct and i can send you mine okay 
which is only my opinion, right? There were several articles in that issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, right. There's your topic for next time. So what's therapy? What's coaching? What's mentoring? I guess throwing as well. What's advising? There's so many different versions of where it could go. What's consultation? Um, let's see if we can not come up with an answer. That wouldn't be the intent, but just to discuss it so that you can be happy where you place yourself and in relation to where you place yourself, what you call yourself and how you sell yourself. So I'm, I'm over the top. Bearing in mind, I work in healthcare, so I have to be squeaky clean. If a new client comes to me with something that's clearly a health-related coaching, I start by saying I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not a registered therapist, I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this. <laughs> if in the middle you feel there's some stress and anxiety related to your issue, I'm very happy to coach you on that bit. <laughs> so I kind of go over the top saying what I'm not. I do a very um, similar thing, Suzanne, mm, for obvious reasons. Yeah, um, absolutely. But it's, it's a very individual thing, isn't it? So I, I think it's a really great conversation to have next time. And I also think it's a conversation that's needed as well, because like you said, it is a grey area. But for some people, it's very, it's less grey. For some people, it's more grey. Um, and for some people, it's very black and white, mm. because it all comes down to those little three words, doesn't it? Hmm. And if you're registered with a particular model that tells you where the boundary is, I guess you've got to consider whether or not you fit wholly in that model. Because hmm. there is a perception that there's, you know, one or two coaching organizations in the world, which is actually not true. There's a lot more than that, that you can choose from to align to. I think it'd be incredibly valuable to help people understand this scope of practice. Yeah. Because this is a conversation that comes up fairly regularly doesn't it over scope of practice yeah it does uh, it does and I uh, you know um a bit like when you first learn NLP you can go out and want to NLP the world and uh, sometimes when people come out of their MBIT coach shirt they are kind of overexcited about what they can do and they'll suddenly find themselves in a difficult position where um, someone's challenging their credentials or skills and saying well who are you to offer that so, yeah, no, great topic. All right, we'll do that for the next one. Great. Fantastic. Just before we, but just before we go. It's still recording I, at the moment. Is this an off recording still before no, we go or still recording? Okay. I'm sure the person I'm about to say this about isn't going to mind it being off recording, but that is an assumption, so I'm hoping I've made it a correct one. Um, can I just say thank you to Clive for your beautiful balanced breathing at the beginning um, and just say what a wonderful honour it was to to have that co-regulatory experience with you because you've got such a beautiful voice yeah. thank you there's a funny story behind his voice in that clive and i were <laughs> clive and i were part of a randomized control trial where we were testing embraining and nlp symptom shift and the control or the non um option uh, variable was also a recorded uh you know guided meditation basically and because i love clive's voice i said to clive why doesn't he do the recorded meditations and so he did the recorded meditation for the mbit process and it's beautiful and he did the recorded process for the control and i went no it's too good people will still get a shift <laughs> just because of listening to your voice <laughs> and so i recorded the control one <laughs> So, yeah, um, I'm sure for the right fee, Clive would uh, happily sell you some time and his voice. <laughs> <laughs> think, you know, um, it, yeah, male, I think male voices often have an advantage when you're in that guided oh. meditation because of the lower tone. Um, but, yeah, Clive has just got the perfect voice for those guided meditations. We often train together in New Zealand and at the end, I don't know if you did this in, in your trainings, but at the end of the day, you do a guided meditation. I'm lucky enough to have Marvin's permission to be able to use some of his at the end of my trainings, which I've adapted. So they've kind of been Suzanne, but they're largely Marvin's with his permission. And the last few times Clive and I have trained, we've done it as almost like a double induction and boy, is it powerful. It's good fun too, actually. Good fun, yeah. Partner with. It's great, double inductions. 
so uh, maybe at some point the car if we could gift one to the community and uh, record yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. that sounds fantastic yes yeah, good fun good fun all righty well i'm going to love you and leave you it's um you know into my day and uh yeah thanks crystal it's been a really good discussion today really really i think um helpful hopefully and i think we made the right decision to record it so thank you for for that decision and we'll put it out to the community and next time we'll do scopes of practice and coaching versus therapy and see where that discussion goes Thank you All very right. much. I'm going to stop the recording now.